Hello and welcome to this exciting review for a very exciting book, The Beastmaster by Andre Norton. For anyone who's new to my channel, please ignore the mirror imaging, which Android messed up and has so far failed to fix. I'm sharing it with you because I actually quite adore this cover. I've got a lot of Andre Norton and when I came across this in the recent um, shopping event, I still couldn't resist it. It's a beautiful old, it's a peacock edition, um, and I just love this artwork. It's so, it's old, but it's beautiful. The book is in good condition because whoever owned it before me did that thing that I used to do, but have stopped doing where they contacted it. So the cover's, cover's lovely. You've got that really nice illustration and it wraps around to the back. Now, Online, it insists this is a puffin. I don't know where puffin, it's a penguin book, but it clearly says peacock science fiction. Anyway, the book. Andre Norton, actually, the author. The author before the book. Andre Norton was a American science fiction fantasy writer. She died in 2005, I think it was. Um, one of the early science fiction fantasy writers. She's written some marvellous stuff. She's been nominated for a whole heap of awards. I think the first one was for Witch World, which is somewhere up there on that bookshelf, and was my first experience back when I thought that Andre Norton was actually a guy. Many people did. One of her early reviewers describes the author as him while reviewing this book. So I think she also wrote under Andrew North and a couple of alia other aliases. Um, but this was originally copyrighted, copyrighted in 1959, so it's a 1950s book. And yes, I think there were a lot of female authors then who found it easier to just write under male names. She was the first woman um, inducted into the Gandalf Grandmaster Fantasy, which is lovely. And also the first one to be inducted into the Science Fiction Fantasy Hall of Fame, according to Wikipedia, and I believe Wikipedia on this. She wrote a lot of books, and they were all amazing. She's got a delicate touch with narrative. She does do a lot of descriptive work in terms of, of um, world building, I guess you'd call it, world describing. So if you're this person who's traveling through this world along with everything else, and you're looking around and you're seeing things, that's the way she does her description. She's not one of those ones like Lee Brackett, when she goes full descriptive, you're in literature land, it's completely literally event. But Andre Norton tells a story, and she tells it very, very well. In this particular one, that review that I mentioned earlier, was it Kirkus? Oh, let's see if I can find it. I had it, I had it tagged here a while ago. Um, there we go. It's here somewhere. So, Kirkus Reviews, that was it. Fa the fantasy is made convincing by the author's boldness of imagination and by his ability to yield totally to the atmosphere which he creates. Aside from the his, I totally agree. It feels to me as if Andre Norton is very much there and she's part of events. And the way that she yields uh, to the atmosphere draws in the reader. So this isn't a large book by my standards, it's quite... A thin book 184 pages it isn't a fast read there's so much there and it's so enjoyable that I sort of wanted to wallow in it while I was reading it I wasn't just reading it for the result it was the actual journey that was most fun just as it should be and um, so what we've got here is in the Beastmaster our main character is called Horstein Storm he is of First, American First Nations, which was a phrase that wasn't used back then. I can't remember. I think it's Navajo. But apparent, according to this book, at least, their internal name for themselves was Dinner, the people. I'm not sure if that's true. I'm not American. I hope I haven't offended anyone by saying that. It's just well, the way it's represented in this book. So we start off on a... Um, I think it's a base station and we're in a world where 
humankind has spread to the stars and there's colonies here, there and everywhere. Um, and they've just come out of a galactic war with a non-human alien species called the Zik. Kick? Zik. That's it. Z-I-K. And our main character, Hostin Storm, Navajo in descent, he has been a fighter interrupted by Bird. Hello. Most appropriate for this book. He has been a fighter in the battle and he's a beast master. Uh, as a beast master, he has a partly um, mental connection with his team, which consists of a black eagle, a cat that's been genetically engineered from a number of different cats, including a desert cat for these huge fluffy paws, and I believe puma as well. So I think puma, golden cat, puma. Narrow foxy chin and ears, so that sounds to me more like a character, I don't know, cat, big cat, and also two meerkats, and that's his team that he operates with, and he's been a commando, so he was trained to go in, and he's been a major part of the war, he'd go in, he'd find hidden installations, he'd sometimes sabotage them, um, commando fighting, beastmaster, and at the end of the war, the final um, action by the Zik was to completely and utterly devastate Earth. So Earth is now a dead, a dead world. And Storm has got nowhere to return to. We find out that he already had a hit and miss or troubled relationship with his native lands. His grandfather, with whom he did have a relationship but a, not a good one, who he met him only really three or four times. Um, he didn't grow up on the land, though he felt a connection to it whenever he returned to it. And now there's nowhere to return to, so he's adrift. On the space station, you've got a lot of refugees from Earth and from the war and from other planets, and they're allocating them around. So Hustin Steam Storm has chosen the planet that he wants to emigrate to, which is called Azor. And we start off with the commander in front of the relocation. He's worried about him. A lot of people who came out of the war as refugees and with no home left, experiencing a whole range of mental problems. And he suspects that Storm is one of them, um, but he doesn't really have anything to go by. So he releases Storm. Storm goes off to the planet of Azor where his skills with animals mean that he signs on with a pack team, which is taking horses from the spaceport out into the wilderness. I really like Andre Norton's world. It feels a bit like American Wild West. So you've got horses, you've got ranching animals, though they're native animals. Um, the livestock on Azor are sometimes harvested for meat, which is apparently delicious, but it are also harvested for skins, hides, other things. So it's a wealthy, but it's still a, I guess you'd call it a frontier world. Hello, bird. Anyway, he signs off with this to herd live livestock, and um, he makes friends with some of the native people. They're not humans. He gets along well with the majority of the herders. And there's um, suggestions that he could be able to, he would be able to apply for land and become a ranch in his own right. But it's clear to us as readers that he's got some driving force. He's come to this land to meet a particular person called Quaid. We assume there's some sort of unpleasant background. But when he eventually comes face to face with Quaid, it seems that it's one that the, this person doesn't actually know about. So there's this underlying motivation throughout the book that we only that we find at the end, um, but it's partly driving them. Having finished with the herding livestock, which were horses, he gets paid with a horse, so he's got this full complement of animals. Um, and here, a lot of the earlier reviews from the 50s and 60s describe this as being a book that will suit young for youngsters and i don't quite get that i think it makes a very good mature book i think it, there's not really an age 
age limit to who's going to enjoy this book but i think all the animals in there made early 50s and 60s reviewers think that it's aimed at children or younger readers it's 2024 adults are allowed to enjoy books with birds and cats and horses as well animals are not solely the province of children anymore or maybe we were the children back then and we grew up and we still love animals so now that we're old enough we can do whatever we like hey eh? um after that um storm ends up signing up with another expedition this is a survey expedition there are these hints that somewhere in the peak lands there are these caves that suggest that maybe aliens had visited um the planet before and uh, he signs up with the survey team that's going out to look at these caves at the end there it becomes far more complex than that you've got the survey team looking for the caves and then um, some of the natives uh, traveling with them the natives are interesting they're described as having very high-pitched verbal communication which means that the settlers the humans have to communicate with them sort of finger talk or like i guess um hand talk hand talk can't remember what they call it anyway auslan is what we'd call it here so off they go, they're, they're in this survey team with the main surveyor, there's a couple of natives, there's Austin Storm and his team of animals. And then things start to go wrong. There's a huge flood which, take, which separates Storm from the rest of his team. And when he comes back, most of them, though not all of them, have been killed. And it looks to be their work of another team of natives from the planet who are hostile to um, the ones that Storm normally interact has had most interaction with. So we've got the friendly natives, we've got the unfriendly natives, we've got Storm trying to get out of a really interesting installation because they find something that was clearly um, not built either by settlers or by the natives who are disparagingly called goats by the settlers who don't like them. And I've forgotten the name of that they call themselves or that the friendly ones call them. This is bothering me now. Um, 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 Nordies? Norbies? Norbies, that's it. Norbies is the, their name presumably for themselves, settlers for them. But there's always people who don't like the, la the people whose lands they're I involved in taking, and they call them goats. Anyway, they have horns, apparently. I like the fact that this native has got these rolling horns. From anyway. So you've got all these elements, and then with an extra element right at the end, Storm discovers that some of the Zik, the enemies of uh, the war, have a ship halfway buried. And that was an answer, something that he's looking through throughout the book, so spoilers ahead, but kind of not really. He was always wondering why you had these rustlers because they're human rustlers and there's Norby rustlers as well who are taking um, the cattle, horses and other things. And he couldn't see how they were getting them off, off planet. The treaty between the Norbies and the settlers is that there's only one spaceship so that everything is rig rigorously controlled. He couldn't understand why all these herds are being taken out towards the peaks, what, what, what the rustlers or the bandits think they can do with them. He sees this other ship and he gets a clue as to what that's all about. So here we are in the back of beyond in the peaks with these caves that were made by an alien civilization. There's some fascinating storytelling and descriptiveness happening there as well. And you've got all these other, all these elements working together. So the end is actually very exciting, fairly complex, and not a fast read. I will say a couple of times in that ending, a new element would be thrown at you and I'd start to think that it was getting a little bit too much. You already had enough to be going on with. You didn't have to keep adding elements. But at the end of the day, the story is really good. Um, should I spoiler it? No, I'm not going to spoiler the end. I think at least some of the people who watch this are either going to read this or would enjoy it if they did read it. I enjoyed the ending. Uh, with Storm. I like the way that Andre Norton didn't stop injuries from happening, but there weren't too many serious ones. 
and I like that Storm has a pleasant end to his story. Apparently, actually, sequels were written to this, but very much later. I'm not sure I'd go out looking for them specifically. It's a very nice book in its own right. And if you end up wanting to know more about the world of Azor, and I, I will admit that I did, you'll have to imagine it for yourself because it sounds like it's a interesting world. A lot could be done with it. Um, the main character is well written. He's very much an Andre Norton character. And if you've read much of Andre Norton, I'm sure you'll get that. He is... He has his own inner life and his own feelings, the own thing, his the own thing, his own story, as it were. But it's not blatantly shoved at you. You learn it through the story and what he says and what he does. It's a slow reveal, as it were. And some of those, some of the parts of the reveal are great fun, but none of them are the primary focus. He is the character who is moving through the story. I like that about Andre Norton. I like that in The Witch Worlds. I like that in the other books of hers that I've read. And I think that's probably all I've got to say about this really nice little book from the 50s. Amazingly contemporary, I'm going to say, for a book from the 50s. And thoroughly enjoyable and would recommend to anyone who likes classic science fiction, Andre Norton, stories with books, just any of those. It'll be for you. I'm pretty sure. I can't imagine anyone not liking it. Thank you for watching, comment, subscribe, all that sort of algorithm-y stuff, and read good books.